thanks very much, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank the organizing group. Uh, so this is a view of where we are from Windsor, which is where I live. And Henry Ford is just beyond those big buildings. And as Mike said, the objective of this um, lecture is, a set of lectures, is uh, to present this um, issue to frame the question, uh, why is hypofractionation or high dose radiation working so well? And can we explain it from a biological point of view? And perhaps this, if we understand it, then we can make it better and uh, improve in the future. So um, perhaps give some future directions. <clears throat> I have no conflicts of interest. <clears throat> it hurts to say it. OK, so as we've heard, um, high dose radiation is gaining acceptance for many reasons. Um, there's clinical evidence at the level three evidence that um, published data showing that it works uh, better than um, fractionated. Uh, this paper by Linsky, seminal paper, uh, showed that in comparison, head to head, um, SRS is at least as good. Uh, perhaps better. <clears throat> so the questions that Mike framed were, um, why? Uh, because the four R's of radiobiology would suggest it shouldn't work so well. Um, hypofractionation uh, shouldn't work when there's hypoxia. Hypoxia is re makes cells resistant, and at higher doses, this will dominate. And so there's a major question. Clinically, we know that some tumors that respond very poorly to a fractionated schedule, melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, anaplastic thyroid cancers, they respond when those tumors metastasize to the brain and are small and treated with high dose radiation, they melt away. Uh, and yet, those tumors that do respond to a fractionated schedule respond similarly at the high dose. What's going on? You know, how can these cells, from a bio biological point of view, uh, respond so much better uh, when biologically they really shouldn't? So if we can understand how it works, um, then we can optimize the parameters that um, dictate. And so um, there's a number of explanations, as we've heard in the last talk, of why this works. And I'll just go over them briefly just to nail them home. Um, so tumor cell sensitivity. Uh, it's been reported in a Nature paper by Zivi Fuchs and Kolosnik at um, uh, Sloan Kettering that um, endothelial cells are uh, sensitive to radiation and that's why high dose radiation works. So. Um, they showed uh, very elegantly that the endothelial cells die by an apoptotic pathway, a, a programmed cell death, uh, by a particular pathway that involves uh, ceramide. And um, they showed, I say elegantly, because they had a knockout animal that had this pathway and one that didn't. And when they plotted tumor volume as a function of days uh, after tumor implantation, and they radiated with 15 gray. Uh, the one that had the pathway um, was more sensitive. Um, but the question is, why they, they also showed that that pathway exists in normal cells. And so the, the immediate question is, how can you get this high dose radiation working so well in tumors? Uh, but it doesn't damage normal tissue. And so this pathway is not that attractive if uh, you're looking for a differential response. Um, Chang Song at the University of Minnesota says, ah, no, it's anoxia in the tumor that's causing the difference um, between high dose radiation and low dose. <clears throat> uh, so he looked at blood flow changes <clears throat> after radiation. And he showed that, um, yes, they do go down a day, two days after radiation, and that's what's killing the cells.
This is data from his lab showing clonogenic fraction. He took the cells right out of the tumor, either one day after radiation, two days after radiation, three days after radiation, or immediately after. And he found that the longer you waited, uh, in general, uh, more cell kill. And it's a lot. It's a, a log of extra cell kill. So uh, that's why high-dose radiation is working, is because it's killing the blood vessels, and so the cells die because they starve. That could work as well, but he used large tumors. And um, it's very difficult to repeat these studies. Uh, so he he's, has a very large collection of data um, from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and um, all with big, to big tumors and big doses of radiation. And uh, the effect is very small. I've had trouble repeating them. Um, others say, uh, no, it's the immune system, that this high dose of radiation is uh, causing antigens in the tumor to be expressed. And the immune system sees those and mops them up. And so that's what's causing high dose radiation to be so effective. Uh, so Sarah Maria at NYU uh, is a proponent of this, and she's shown, shown very elegantly that this works. But again, uh, no difference between a tumor and a normal tissue. It doesn't explain a differential response. And as we've heard, uh, maybe no new biology is needed. Maybe the LQ bottle fits and, uh, and end of story. Uh, and so uh, Brenner and uh, Martin Brown uh, show this um, plot of data, tumor control probability as a function of radiation dose. And they say whether you give high dose or low dose in these lung cancers, um, the curve fits. So you don't need a new biology. Um, but it's a little bit disheartening that those error bars are so large. And um, so for the single fraction, the red ones, um, yes, they don't look different from, say, the green ones, the fractionated. Uh, but it's kind of hard to say based on this data. And um, let's see. if you look a little bit more closely or consider this uh, data a little bit more closely, um, plotting tumor response as a function of dose, if the cells are sensitive, um, They, uh, the ship, the uh, dose response curve is to the left, and if they all of a sudden become sensitive, so if the resistant there, if they all of a sudden become resistant, oh, let me say that again. Uh, the red curve is if they're sensitive. Oh, thanks very much. So if a radiation dose um, causes a tumor response uh, at low doses, uh, but all of a sudden, at um, a higher dose, the, um, the curve shifts uh, so that the, the um, dose response becomes uh, more sensitive. So they start as saying this resistant curve, high doses needed to cure them, and then uh, all of a sudden at some higher dose, the red curve kicks in. Uh, then you get this composite curve, which is um, steeper than what you'd expect. And so, so the question here with the Brenner data and um, Martin Brown's data is, is the high dose, is the single fraction data steeper? And uh, I would just say it's impossible to say whether there's a steeper curve here or not based on those large error bars. So, and as Mike pointed out, uh, there's other problems with the um, LQ model. So, but that, uh, their strongest data is suspect, is all I can say. And so uh, the verdict is out. Are there other explanations? Absolutely, there's uh, every time you read the literature. And so I wanted to talk about some exciting new data from our lab. Um, Jim Ewing is my colleague. Uh, so these data, this uh, study was done in rats, but it's extremely intriguing and it suggests maybe um, another phenomenon is taking place. So um, an animal model was used. Uh, this is um, uh, human tumors grown in the brains of rats. Uh, MRI was uh, used to measure vascular parameters. And we watched uh, blood flow change as a function of time after radiation. And unlike what was done in the past, where blood flow was looked at one day, two days, a week later, 
we looked immediately after radiation. Uh, we didn't really expect to see big changes, but this was uh, um, serendipitously uh, observed, and, um, and we were pleased to, to see that something happened. Uh, we looked at blood flow. We also looked at permeability and also extravascular uh, space, so this uh, space outside of the cells and outside of the vessels. We gave a large dose, 20 gray, so 25 rats, uh, five rats per group, um, and we also looked at normal tissue. Uh, we used the clinical machine, and um, we gave two MRIs, one before radiation, one after, and we either looked at two hours after, four hours after, 8, 12, or 24. As I said, the tumors were implanted. They were uh, human glioma. And uh, the parameters measured were uh, either tumor blood flow using arterial spin labeling or um, K-trans using DCE MRI. And um, we also got a VE measure from that. So radiation alone um, prolongs survival. And this is percent survival as a function of time. And if untreated, they die at about day 30 or 40. And if given 20 gray, um, more like 100 days. And here's the take home message. This is percent change in tumor blood flow as a function of time. And uh, immediately after the radiation, blood flow dropped like a rock. It went to 80% of what it was uh, consistently, five out of five animals. And at four hours later, it was still low. But at 24 hours later, it was back up above where it was before. And um, in normal tissue, plus or minus 20%, uh, not much change. Uh, maybe a little bit down, maybe a little bit up. But um, our measure, the measure of blood flow, I mean, normal blood flow changes. And so um, we typically say any change within 20% uh, not a big deal. As far as the uh, permeability or the K-trans, um, that also went down and and um, uh, 24 hours later, as uh, Chang, Chang Song has shown, uh, initially it was slightly up. And interestingly, um, the extravascular space was down initially, suggesting the cells swelled and uh, cause less space between cells. So perhaps that's the first thing that happens. Maybe that's what causes blood flow, but that's the question. Um, but what's intriguing, what I want to bring your attention to, is this um, phenomenon of a decrease in blood flow in tumor and an increase in blood flow later, which is reminiscent of an ischemia reperfusion. Of course, if this happened in the heart or in the brain, uh, that would be a bad thing. So a heart after a heart attack or a brain after a stroke, um, ischemia reperfusion causes all kinds of extra damage. And uh, if that's happening in the tumor, wow, maybe that can explain some of the extra cell kill that you get. So intriguing. This is blood flow. This is not tumor response. Um, as far as the damage in the tumor, um, non-irradiated, this is um, a one, uh, 10 times magnification up to 40 times. Um, and uh, it shows really uh, not much uh, damage. The cells are tightly packed and um, they look healthy and happy. Whereas even two hours after a big dose of radiation, there were large areas of actualization, damaged cells um, on their way to being killed or maybe dead. Um, and this was consistently seen. As far as apoptosis, we saw, yes, some. It wasn't just at the endothelial cells. It was everywhere, but not much. And the same, uh, roughly the same in unirradiated as in uh, irradiated. Maybe slightly higher, but um, certainly that can't explain it. So in summary, um, there's vascular changes that happen very soon after a big dose of radiation. Um, and these are uh, associated with uh, damage in the tumor. Very interestingly, um, Parkins and colleagues in the 1990s 
in the old gray labs uh, where Mike Joyner is from, um, documented that if they induced ischemia reperfusion in a tumor, kind of independent of radiation, if they just clamped it and then opened the tumor, they got a lot of extra cell kill. And so uh, maybe it's not unexpected that a decrease in blood flow down to 80% and then an increase in blood flow after can cause extra damage. And they published a series of papers, uh, although they ended around 1998 and um, not much since then. So, um, but I think it's a, an intriguing phenomenon that requires further study. Um, this describes ischemia reperfusion, um, and this is taken from the internet. Um, and they're trying to explain cardiac uh, ischemia or uh, stroke. And um, what happens is um, the ATP is converted to uh, hypoxanthine, which under reperfusion becomes a reactive oxygen species or a reactive nitrogen species. And th this is what causes the damage. So um, uh, I'll take a jump now into perhaps future work or uh, discussion. Um, so uh, James Watson, um, Nobel Prize winner, <laughs> has uh, said many controversial things. But one of the, uh, the areas that uh, he's focused on now is um, that reactive oxygen species uh, can explain all the types of damage that happen to tumors, whether it's radiation or many different chemotherapies uh, or even anti-angiogenic agents. And so what I propose is that a high dose of radiation uh, with um, an agent that also causes reactive oxygen species together may um, induce this ischemia reperfusion phenomenon uh, to cause extra cell kill. And so we've started a study uh, where we're investigating um, things that, what can cause uh, extra reactive oxygen species in the time after radiation, uh, and when combined with radiation, can be even more um, damaging. And uh, the agents that we've looked at are uh, mTOR inhibitors, everolimus, and this just shows uh, zero gray, um, five gray, yes, ROS goes up, and ROS, the reactive oxygen species here, were measured using this uh, DCFDA uh, fluorescence technique. The mTOR inhibitor by itself causes some increase in ROS, and together with radiation, it goes up higher. Uh, we've seen the same thing with arsenic and with metformin. Uh, metformin is a widely used anti-diabetic drug that's uh, giving patients that, diabetic patients that are on it that are uh, also receiving radiation for completely different reason, they have cancer, um, are responding better. And so uh, that's a very interesting agent and perhaps some of its effect is mediated with, by ROS. So lots of remaining questions. <clears throat> um, are ROS involved? Uh, is this ischemia reperfusion real? And if so, um, what's the best way to optimize it? And timing seems to be everything. That when you time these drugs with the radiation and you get the ROS at a particular time to cause this ischemia reperfusion phenomenon uh, in our hands, uh, that works best. So I want to acknowledge the many people that have uh, contributed to this, the science here. Of course, the chairman, Ben Mofsis, and Chetty, uh, my director, um, Winston Ningwen, who will be a speaker later, uh, and many others. Uh, but of course, uh, the immediate group that uh, has done these studies is headed by Jay Ho Kim, uh, the former chairman of the department, and uh, Jim Ewing is shown here. Thank you very much.